Welcome to the third episode of Because I'm Carlos podcast, not the audio archive version, but rather the actually recording something specifically for this feed version. Now, what brings this one about was me thinking about the article I read on Sports Collectors Daily regarding the sale of the collection of Dr. Thomas Newman. He was the he was the doctor who basically had that collection full of a ton of great vintage cards. One of the big feature pieces being that 1933 Gaudi Babe Ruth, the yellow back version in a PSA 9, which is a pop one that sold for $4.2 million. Now, basically what made me kind of think about that is, first of all, I was really happy to kind of just be able to think about and talk about something that wasn't one of those valuations. And part of the reason I was thinking about it a little bit more was that it was kind of interesting. And, you know, within days of that happening, around the same time, we also had the Steph Curry, you know, the $5.9 million valuation. And I already talked about kind of in a previous episode here where, you know, when is a sale not a sale? And I really want to separate this and distinct between the evaluation that is done with a fractional arrangement versus a sale. Even a uh, private sale, similar to what happened with the Rob G $5.2 million 52 Tops Mantle PSA 9, at least that's a private sale. I'm still not super happy with the whole private sale thing, but, it, but as long as two parties are able to come to terms on something and money changes hands, it's still a sale as far as I'm concerned. But when it comes to some of these big ticket items, really the, the one that always is going to make me the most comfortable is going to be when something goes into an open auction and everybody in that tax bracket, not I and not most of the people that I know, but whoever's in that tax bracket and wants to make a play for it is open and able to do so. And that really allows us to get a better gauge, in my opinion, of where the market goes. So I was very happy to see that, you know what, 4.2 million for some people, they thought that was actually low. But to be honest, I feel that some of the other valuations that we've gotten, if you really think about where some of those other 5 million plus have all come from, they've almost all come from the realm of private deals. The LeBron James RPA, that was a private deal. The uh, Rob G, you know, 52 Tops Mantle, PSA 9, that was a private deal. That doesn't mean they're illegitimate. They're at least sales, in my opinion, based on the discussion I had before. But it's still different than just put it up in the auction, let it ride, and let the rich people bid over it, and let's just see what happens. Because at least that feels like, like I said, it's more a feeling than anything else than anything objective. It's just a feeling, but at least it feels like you got a chance to find out a little bit better what the going rate was for that item. And 4.2 million, regardless, even with the buyer's premium, that's a tremendous sale. It is not an insignificant sum, and it is certainly worthy of a, of a, of a truly great card. Now, when comparing the two, like I said, I don't want to focus too much and fixate on the two, but I do think these two give uh, an opening. So I wanted to use kind of the uh, the Gaudi Ruth as an opening to kind of a different discussion. And it's a conversation that I've had ad nauseum, multitude of times with other collector and hobbyists and friends and things like that. And it really comes down to this very concept. And these two cards are perfect in the sense of how they juxtapose this idea. And here's what it is. It is the idea of scarcity. And if I'm uh, if I remember to do it so correctly, the idea of calling this episode is that scarcity is scarcity. And what I'm getting at when I say that is that you have to understand that scarcity's definition doesn't change. It's a very simple idea. It's the state of being scarce or in short supply, a shortage. And that's a dictionary definition. That's what scarcity is. You'll notice that nowhere in that little definition, they don't talk about what I what we refer to as organic scarcity or manufactured scarcity or conditioned scarcity. So these are kind of three things that get thrown around the hobby a little bit. I don't know if the organic scarcity gets thrown around as much, but manufactured scarcity and conditioned scarcity definitely do. But let me explain quickly what organic scarcity is. This is the idea. And usually where this comes up is when I when I deal in circles where I'm talking to vintage collectors because they really obsess over this idea. And I, it's not one or two. I've talked to a number of them that do obsess over this concept. Organic scarcity really is the whole notion. It's, it's a romantic notion, really, more than a, an objective fact. It is a romantic notion that there's somehow a more... Uh, nobility. There's a, a greater validity to scarcity that is a result of attrition, time and attrition. So you imagine, you know, the T206 cards that came out originally in the 1910, 1909, 1910, 1911. Well, they made millions of them, not of all the different players, but they did, but they made millions upon millions of these cards. Now, not all of them have survived to this day. Quite a number of them still have. It's still a very, not obviously other than the ultra scarcities, it is still a group of cards that are still available. You can get T206 cards. A lot of times you may have to settle for a lower condition in some cases because attrition has taken an impact. Some of those cards, they printed X amount back then and not all of them are available today. Over 100 years will do that. That's attrition. 
So in that situation where there's a scarcity because of attrition, for them, that would be a quote-unquote organic scarcity and theoretically more legitimate, quote-unquote. Same idea if you take the golden era, uh, you take the 1950s baseball and all that. Part of the idea here is that they produce X number back then. But between kids putting cards in bike spokes, between you know parents throwing the cards out, between all these different things happening between the 1950s and today, then those cards that survive are quote-unquote organically scarce because of time and attrition versus something like manufactured scarcity. Panini goes out, makes a one-on-one Steph Curry logo man. They only produce what? It was done intentionally. It was done in the factory, just like that. And then in the same vein, the Babe Ruth, that card wasn't, isn't a one-of-one, but it's a population one because in a PSA 9, there's only one in that condition and none higher. So that's condition scarcity. But, you know, that would be kind of overlooked because in general terms, the card is a little bit scarcer because, again, time and attrition. So there is an overall organic scarcity, and then there's a condition scarcity tacked on top of that as well. So, it, it you know, it adds that extra element. But you do you just need to understand that there's these different concepts of scarcity. But all we're really talking about is something being limited, something being a scarce supply. That's it. And it's very funny and to me sometimes when I have these conversations where it's like, and I understand it because it comes to an emotional element to it. There is an emotional element to it because it, it feels, it feels more proper to have that organic scarcity. It feels different than if they manufactured it that way to be quote unquote scarce. And really this position is really a, a pushback against modern. I do understand it, but it's one of those things that's kind of funny and interesting because organ, uh, you know, manufactured scarcity isn't new either. It's, it's one of the great kind of fun things. And let's use that 1933 Gaudi set since we talked about the Ruth. Let's use that as an example. What about the 1933 Gaudi set? Well, maybe some of those folks need to go look into that set and they're going to see the 1933 Gaudi Nap Lajue card. Well, that one is a manufactured scarcity in addition to having the attrition and all that. Why? Because originally it wasn't issued. The idea wasn't that for that card to exist. It wasn't supposed to actually happen. People had to actually go and reach out. And they realized that that card was not included in the original 33 Gaudi set. So it took until 1934 for collectors to be able to actually get the card. They had to get it directly from the manufacturer, directly from Gaudi, in order to finish their set, because that card was never issued and never intended to be released. But then once people kind of ca caught onto this, it's like nobody has one of these. They eventually were able to pressure Gaudi into actually producing them, but you had to go to the mail and actually contact them, and then you would receive them back mailed with a paperclip. So I'll include a link to kind of a PSA's little write-up on this card, just so you can have that little short story about it. But in this case, it's kind of funny, because in this case, what you've got is you've got from 1933, so going on approaching 90 years, you've got a manufactured intentional scarcity. Technically, it should have been a population zero, but as a result of this, it, it still was a lot in a lot less availability. It was not available in the abundance because it was never intended for issue and it never made it out into the gum packs at all. So it was not available through that means. So in this case, you've got manufactured scarcity combined with the fact that once you did get the card, there is some attrition because they did put it in with a paper clip so you could have some damage potentially. So a condition scarcity again comes into play. So you can have... In this case, it's funny because that Nap Lajue is an example of you can have manufactured scarcity combined with time and attrition, organic scarcity, quote unquote, combined with a potential condition scarcity if you've got one at high grade. So these ideas are not mutually exclusive is the point I'm trying to get across. But it is very funny that at the end of the day, there is that psychological component. Now, the follow up question to this is, so why does it matter so much? Why is this whole scarcity thing such a you know issue with some of these folks? And it really comes down to this idea. And this is something that uh, you know it be, it's beyond the scope of this you know little podcast segment that I'm making here to really go into the full depth. But there is a psychological component to it. We love the idea of having something that's rare because, for lack of a better term, it makes us feel special. It's something we you know we don't necessarily have to lord it over people, but just knowing, just knowing that we have something they can't have. There's a certain satisfaction to that. And there are psychology papers and psychology studies written in about this exact same kind of thing. Why do we like scarcity so much? And the great irony is that one of the fun things when they're talking about a lot of the modern, uh, a lot of modern cards and, you know, modern, the modern hobby, they look to, you know, the sneaker kids that came in. Well, the sneaker kids have a full understanding of that concept of, you know, the hype. Well, cards can play into the hype too, but they keep trying to throw it into, oh, the hype, the hype, the hype. Well, at the end of the day, hype is just another word for there is a desirability. So if the demand exceeds the supply, you have a scarcity. Scarcity doesn't mean there's only one copy out there. Scarcity just means 
that more people want it than can have it. There's a sense of exclusivity. There is a, I can have this, and if I have it, you can't have it necessarily. Maybe you, or maybe you can have it and the third person can't, whatever the case may be. The point is, more of us want it than are actually able to get it, therefore it is scarce. And none of these commodities are necessary. This is just, you know, these are collectibles. It's silly stuff, really, at the end of the day, if we put it into the proper perspective. But like I said, there is a psychological component. But that's what made the whole concept interesting to me. That's what made it fun for me to look. And I, the conversations I've had over and over again continue back to that whole idea of, like I said, organic scarcity being inherently better. It's not. It makes absolutely no difference whatsoever, other than in your head, because it makes you feel better. It makes you feel it's more authentic. But like I said, in the Nap Lajue example, that's a rare vintage card. It's an iconic card. But funny enough, it was manufacturally scarce. They, out of the factory, it was intended to be actually a population zero, but it came out as a result of you know people finding out that there was some shenanigans on behalf of Gaudi. And then once they got caught, well, then they released it. Albeit a year later, it's technically a 1934. But nonetheless, if you wanted to complete your quote-unquote set and really have it in full completeness, well, then you had to have the card in order to really do it. Now, that was a situation where, again, it was done on purpose. Stuff like that happened all throughout, the, all throughout the golden era of baseball cards. Now, most of the time it was accidental. If you go look at the 1953 Topps baseball set, there's 280 cards that's numbered up to, but there's 274 cards actually existing because six of them don't exist on the checklist. This wasn't a Nap Lajue situation. They just had contract issues and were never able to release them, so you're never going to find those six cards. As far as we know, they never actually got manufactured. So in that case, you know, that's... Good old-fashioned attrition, it got removed, it was never, it never had the opportunity to see the light of day. And that's part of the story. But then, same vein, same era, 1954 Bowman, card number 66, there's two of them. There's Jimmy Parcells, and then there's Ted Williams. The Ted Williams did get, it, did get out there, a little bit, but it got pulled and then kind of disappeared almost immediately after, because Topps had the contract for Ted Williams and was able to put him on not one, but two cards in 1954 Topps. So that would be an organic scarcity with a potential condition scarcity, depending on what, what kind of a copy you get. So again, in that situation, the vintage guys would go like, oh, now that's a real scarcity, a real, you know, a rarity. Comparatively speaking, it is compared to a lot of other cards. But even in the 1950s, they made a fair number of cards. They just, you know, slowly, slowly, some of them disappeared over time, got damaged, got thrown out, got lost. That kind of thing happens. The bottom line is this. Scarcity is scarcity, meaning it doesn't matter how we arrived at it because all we were talking about in that whole conversation we were having is we were talking about different roads that all end up in the same place. The one of one Steph Curry, however you want to position it, is exactly the same as taking another card that had a thousand copies in 1955. I'm just making up a number. A thousand copies and through attrition, only one has survived. If you go through the annals of vintage baseball and vintage sports in general, you're going to find all these obscure sets that have almost no existing copies. What makes them attractive is not scarcity. And this was another piece that I talked about a little bit, and I'll leave kind of end on this piece. Scarcity inherently, there is a psychological component that scarcity can make something more attractive to us. Again, there are psychological studies about this. But a thing you got to consider is that scarcity inherently in and of itself does not make anything better. It can make it feel better if you're already kind of interested and already predisposed to it. Scarcity can make it more attractive. But if you've got something you genuinely don't want, making it scarce isn't going to make it more interesting. Like I said when I talked about that vintage baseball, is that there are a variety of different sets that aesthetically I just think are hideous. But they're rare. Super rare. And for the co collector, the connoisseur, the person who is pursuing the rarest of the rare, these are their holy grails. These are the pieces they're seeking. These are the, some of the toughest of the tough. Talking about that T206 set, there is a Ty Cobb with a Ty Cobb back. That is rarer than the Honus Wagner. That could theoretically be one of the most iconic cards there is out there. They're not easy to come by. For some people, that'd be interesting. And for some people, you know, it's a Ty Cobb card. So be it. Yeah, it's a rarer version of it. Again, so be it. That Baltimore Bay Bruth, that is a super, super, super rare card. Frankly, it's hideous. Again, in my opinion. Strictly in my aesthetic, not a good looking card. I wouldn't want it at any price unless my intention was to resell it. I don't care about it, but I can respect Babe Ruth. I can be very interested. There are Babe Ruth cards that would interest me. That is not one of them. But can I respect it for its rarity? Can I respect it for its place in history? Absolutely. 100%. But scarcity does not necessarily make something more attractive. It does not necessarily make it better. And the type of scarcity doesn't change the definition of scarcity. So like I said, scarcity is scarcity. Whether it's organic, whether it's manufactured, or whether it's condition, 
The only thing that changes is how you feel about it and whether it makes you want something more or less. And that's all that really matters as far as, far as that's concerned. We just have to acknowledge at the end of the day that there is that psychological component and that is going to differ. What's going to work for you is not going to work for me necessarily or vice versa. And just because something is rare doesn't mean you're necessarily going to want it. And if you have something rare that no one wants, it's not going to have value. We just have to get past this idea, get past this paradigm in our heads that scarcity equals value. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And we have to get past this idea that scarcity equals better. It doesn't. It just means it's scarce. That's it. That's as far as it goes. It might make it more attractive to you, but it doesn't make it better in any way, shape, or form. And one type of scarcity doesn't, is no better than any other type except inside your head. And that's the way it always was. And that's the way it'll always be. But for some people, you know, keep fighting the good fight. So apparently your type of scarcity is different than somebody else's. If it makes you feel better, by all means, go for it. Anyway, that's it. what I wanted to say. I wanted to take that Babe Ruth card and I wanted to kind of uh, take it down the path a little bit talking about some scarcity today. So that'll conclude this episode. Let me know uh, kind of what you think about this one. You can reach out to me on Instagram with Carlos Cards 12. It's at Carlos Cards 12. I'll include some of the some of the links in the description of both the YouTube and in the audio version. And let me know what you think. Uh, you know, am I out to lunch? Do you somehow believe that one version of scarcity is actually different than another? It isn't. But I'll still I'll still be happy to hear your argument and points on it. Otherwise, though, do you have any thoughts on where maybe the fixation with scarcity comes for you? How do you feel about it? Do you care about it at all? Does something being more scarce even interest you? Does it concern you in any way, shape, or form? Does it make something more appealing to you that would otherwise maybe be less appealing to you if it wasn't as scarce? Just some food for thought. Anyway, so that's it for this one. We'll uh, do episodes semi-regularly when uh, a topic comes up that I think is worthwhile. And otherwise, like I said, the YouTube channel, because I'm Carlos, that is the hub for all the media and all the different versions of content that I make. Thanks very much. We'll catch you in the next one.